All right, all, without further ado, I am so pleased to begin this session today. Thank you all for your attendance and welcome uh, to the very first uh, Archaeological Society of Jamaica webinar series. We, we hope to continue this moving forward. My name is Dr. Zachary Beyer. Uh, I'm the archaeologist at the UE Mona. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and, and current president of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. Uh, I'll be in charge of moderating today's session along with a handful of other executive members of the, of the ASJ. Uh, to begin, I really just want to extend my thanks to, to these members of the ASJ that have, that have really made this virtual event possible uh, with technology, with advertising, following up with contributors. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And it's most certainly a pleasure to have you all today to host the contributors that we have um, on, on, on this event, especially during the week of Indigenous Peoples uh, Day, formerly Columbus Day, a day formerly perhaps celebrated, a day now we are, we are remembering uh, through, through history, through archeology. span So our first installment focuses on the collision between Jamaica and European worlds uh, at the start of the 16th century. A literal collision, I guess, uh, uh, during Columbus's fourth voyage involving the intentional beaching of two Colombian uh, Columbus caravels in 1503. But a much, and I, and I think the archaeology and the discussions today will really bring out the longer social and cultural collision beginning in 1493 on Columbus's second voyage, bringing together prehistoric historical societies indigenous island chiefdoms with rich history extending back thousands of years, uh, met by expanding pre-industrial states extending their, their world order. So today we're gonna, we're foc our discussion is framed by some key questions focused at some key sites in Jamaica, Sevilla La Nueva and Maima. Uh, the questions listed on the, uh, well not listed on the flyer, but listed on the description include what does archaeology reveal about the nature of this collision, the nature of interaction? How did patterns of indigenous European interaction affect exploration, settlement, exchange, identity formation, and everyday life in Jamaica in the first half of the 16th century? My, my strong thanks to our contributors. Uh, we've got Dr. Ivor Connolly here. Uh, who's going to be providing introductions. He's the chair of the session. He's going to provide the intro to, the, to our session as well as the conclusion. Dr. Connolly is a PhD in history, specifically archaeology, from the University of the West Indies, Mona. He is a Caribbean archaeologist with special focus on the indigenous peoples of Jamaica, on which his PhD thesis is based. He has lectured in archaeology at the UE Mona, published numerous papers in archaeology and history, and has presented, in pa uh, has presented papers in archaeology island-wide. He is uh, one of our leading members of the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. He's also involved with the Georgian Society of Jamaica, the Jamaican Historical Society, and the Jamaican Caving Organization. He's a busy man. He's good to know. He's a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, and he's headed numerous uh, archaeological investigations on pre-Columbian sites, plantation sites, and industrial sites. Our next presenter, following Ivor, will be Dr. David Burley, uh, who, who originates from St. John, New Brunswick, on Canada's Atlantic coast. Uh, he undertook uh, BA and MA degrees at the University of, of New Brunswick. His PhD was completed in 1979 at Simon Fraser University, with dissertation research centered in, uh, in the Northwest, uh, on Northwest Pacific prehistory. Eventually, he returned to Simon Fraser, as a faculty member in the Department of Archaeology in 1985, where he continues today as a senior professor. Uh, over the past three decades, David's research has focused largely on Polynesian origins in the South Pacific Kingdom of Tonga and Republic of Fiji. Robin Woodward first invited him to join the Sevilla La Nueva project in 2004, and he has led excavations at the early 16th century uh, Spanish butchery there, as well as the Taino village of Maima, which I have a feeling he will be highlighting uh, today. Next, our, our final presenter uh, uh, is Dr. Robin Woodward. 
uh, uh, Dr. Woodward has a passion for adventure, art, archaeology. Uh, these diverse interests have carried her through several degrees, including a BA in the history of art from Queen's University in Kingston, uh, Ontario, a BSc in art conservation from University College Cardiff, Wales, an MA in anthropology, nautical archaeology from Texas A&M, and then finally her PhD in archaeology from Simon Fraser in uh, 2007. In between these many degrees, she has spent time studying art in Venice and working as a conservator and archaeologist in both Turkey and Jamaica. She's currently an adjunct professor in the archaeology department at Simon Fraser. Uh, she represents the Institute of Nautical Archaeology at the Texas A&M during meetings of UNESCO's Convention of the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. She also lectures on cruises for Lindbald Expeditions, National Geographic, Seaborne, and Viking Ocean Cruises. Take me with you, Robin. Robin began her love affair with Jamaican archaeologists as while a grad student in the nautical program at Texas A&M uh, during their first four years of the Port Royal project. So Robin's got some extensive experience across the island. During this time, while, uh, uh, while on the Port Royal project, she studied Charles Cotter's collection uh, of materials from Sevilla La Nueva for her MA thesis. She returned to Jamaica in 2001 to initially survey and excavate the Spanish sugar mill for a PhD dissertation, but along with David Burley and several S uh, Simon Fraser grad students and members of the JNHT archeology span staff, along with Ivor Connolly, continued to find and excavate numerous Spanish and Taino features on the, the JNHT Seville Heritage Estate for over the last 19 years. It is a pleasure having you all here today uh, uh, and be able to bring together this this, this passion and this, this experience. But uh, along with, the, with our distinguished contributors, I wanna take some time to recognize the presence of you all in this session, some notable individuals as well as institutions. We have with us today, and it's such a pleasure, Captain Charles, uh, Charles Cotter's son, Reverend Graham uh, Cotter, uh, 94 years young. Thank you, Father, for, for, for attending today. Your father led, led early exca uh, excavations at Seville and was a founding member of the Archaeological Society that we now are continuing that legacy along with Dr. James Lee. Uh, God bless you, sir. Uh, we also have, uh, I are, 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 I've already recognized executive members of the Jamaican National Heritage, uh, sorry, the Archaeological Society of Jamaica, but I also want to recognize uh, individuals from the Jamaican National Heritage Trust that are currently in the session, UE Mo my colleagues at UE Mona, individuals from NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Jamaica High Commission, Northern Caribbean University, Northwestern University, St. Mary's College, Maryland, Millersville University, University of Kentucky, University of Toronto, Friends of the Georgian Society of Jamaica, Jamaica Historical Society. I know, I'm keep going. DAX, Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, Harvard University, Vanderbilt University, Max Planck Institute, University of Leicester, British Museum, British Library, Virginia Museum of Natural History, Georgian Southern University, University of Lethbridge, Institute of Nautical Archaeology, and finally the Universidad Catolica de Pernambuco. Uh, welcome, welcome all. We look forward today to a fruitful discussion that will no doubt uh, inform, but hopefully also inspire further research on Spanish Jamaica and indigenous European interaction during this crucial period of, of Jamaican history, of Jamaican history uh, as well as world history. Just a reminder, and I'll do better at posting these in the chat, make sure you introduce yourself, provide your affiliation in the chat, but keep yourself muted for the time being. Uh, hold your questions, comments until the end. Uh, you can post in the chat or raise your hand and we will call on you. We've got a handful of people working in this session uh, in, order to, in order to get you all involved. If you are using social media, uh, please use the hashtags ASJWebinar and, and Archaeology Jamaica. I now want to provide the opportunity for, uh, to welcome uh, uh, our new cacique, Jamaica's new cacique, Kalan Nebronex Kaiman. Uh, 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 as I mentioned, Jamaica's recently appointed chief. Uh, uh, Kasike Kalan is going to provide us with an opening prayer. 
honoring our Taino ancestors. Uh, Kalan will be followed by the chair of our session, Dr. Ivor Connolly, who will provide his opening remarks. And as I mentioned, following uh, 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 David's and Robin's presentation, uh, Ivor will have the opportunity to conclude ahead of, ahead of comments and questions. Thank you all for your attendance. I look forward to, to more discussion. Uh, please, please, uh, uh, Kalan, you, you are you're welcome to take the floor. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Today and this week, this month, is a special time for our indigenous ancestors of this land. Today is the beginning of a, a new moon. And today is symbolic of the Kohiba Kati, or the moon in which we would start the process for growing Kohiba, or tobacco. This time is a time of reflection. Um, offerings are normally done and prayers to ensure that as we enter the end of the, the hurricane season, the hurricane season, Waban Sesh, the semi of the hurricanes is appeased. And in modern times, since the collision, it's also the time used to honor ancestors after the atrocities that they faced. And under that resilience of the Taino resurgence and the acknowledgement of our heritage today. So I'll be doing a traditional call to the four directions, the four winds, the mother earth, the father sky, declaring our intention for them to be a part of this gathering and to honor all our relatives around the globe. Aiko, Aiko, Waria, Aura, Wabonitoya. On the winds of the south, we call the medicine of the Aura, in Jamaica, we call the turkey vulture, the medicine of Wabonito, the healer, the one who healed Wahayona, the great cacique. To bring healing to this space, we start with healing, we start with acknowledging the direction of the south. Wariko, wariko, waria, soraya, kwaibe, makitari, wayaba, mukaroya, buyiria, opieru, abiran. Off from the winds of the west, the medicine of the cacique, the, the, the chief of the land of the ancestors, the honor those who have passed from ancient times till now. Many have made that transition during this pandemic. I will honor and acknowledge their efforts, their contributions, those who have contributed to this space, to this gathering, the wisdom that we're here to share today. We acknowledge and we honor you. We go by many names. And Hankatu. In the winds of the north, we honor the first cacique, Wahayona, Wahayona, who took that great journey out from the cave to gain medicine and teachings to bring back to us. And likewise, we've continued in that tradition of sharing the knowledge that we've gained with others to benefit them, to bring healing and medicine. We honor the medicine of the sacred bird of our tribe, the wanini, the zumzum, the colibri, the hummingbird that teaches and brings wisdom. It says the hummingbird learns secrets as it sips the sweet nectar from the flowers. So too, may we share that wisdom with those that are open and eager today. In the winter of the east, wariko, wariko, waria, iguana buena, marohu, buenael, mautia tihuel, from the wind of the east, we call it the medicine from the cave that the sun and the moon arrive from, the cave Iguana Moina. We call it that medicine that allows us to start a new day with blessings, with honor, with acknowledging that we have an opportunity to create change, positive change, especially in these times and these days. We honor the medicine of the Warawau, the red tailed hawk, that gives us vision. We call today the chicken hawk in Jamaica. We honor the medicine of the chinchilin, which we call the blackbird today, that sings and makes its presence known, its thoughts, its feelings. Touching the earth, we honor Mother Earth and all our relatives, stone kind, plant kind, animal kingdom, all nations, all people, all ethnicities. For we are all one, children of this planet. 
the great provider we honor you and give you thanks for this moment in time to learn to grow to share and finally around us I call what we call Amaltesh Wabansesh, spirit of the spiraling mother of storms. We honor that medicine of cleansing. We also ask that with the knowledge that there are storms out at sea, that we shall have peaceful times, that what is to be shall be in a good way. So we end by saying, and hand so it is. Thank you, Kasike. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Connolly, uh, uh, you, you now have the opportunity to introduce the session. And, and again, you'll have the opportunity to, to, to provide some concluding uh, uh, thoughts as well. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, are you hearing me now? Yes. yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Kasike, as I start this introduction, I must say that it is wonderful that we're able to come together, um, all of us who are interested in the Tainas, their history, their welfare, and uh, their presence among us. Uh, there are many of us, there are not many of us, but there are a few of us who are interested in China's, in Jamaica, and it is important we all get together and uh, in a united way um, advance the, the, the in information about China's in Jamaica. Uh, I'd like to underline Robin Woodward's role in civil. Uh, it, it cannot be overemphasized. Uh, Robin is the person you go to if you want to know anything about Sevilla La Nueva. And uh, uh, she is <laughs> Robin. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm highly prejudiced here because um, my first serious dig was in 2004 with Robin. And um, she invited me to participate and um, it was fantastic. Uh, three months of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and Dave, you know, Dave has been in Tonga, Fiji, and I don't know, um, but here he has brought that perhaps insights from his work in the, in the South Pacific. We, terraces is of course the, the main subject here. And um, Howard, Professor Howard, um, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, he, noticed the presence of marl on, on sites and his explanation was and maybe that has something to do with the, an explanation too was that it sanitized it was a, the function of marl was sanitizing the site um i encountered marl on one of my sites the fairfield site in montego bay jamaica and um okay i understand what howard said and i thought yes but I explored a little further. I never thought of terracing, but I thought maybe there was a landslide event and soil got turned over and I was thinking of all different types of things. And um, it took Dave Bury to have this insight and to follow it up with the necessary investigation. And of course, several, as happened at my email, several Huts, China houses were located. Um, perhaps the only site in Jamaica so far with as many um, as has been found here. So um, without going any further, let me just thank Robin and Dave for their participation here and uh, their involvement, involving me in so many of their digs over the years, including my email. And um, Dave, I think you're going first. Okay, Zach, thank you very much. That's me. 
Thank you, do uh, Dr. Connolly. Yes, we've got now Dr. David Burley. Uh, David, please let me know if you've got any issues sharing screens. I, I, I recognize you and Robin have, have slides that you will be sharing with us today. Thank you, Zach. Um, first, yes. first I, I wanted to thank uh, Kasike for that moving uh, introduction or, or greeting. Um, uh, it's very heartening to see the uh, appreciation of, of Taino uh, peoples in, in Jamaica today and to know that their uh, ancestors are continuing on uh, a very uh, rich cultural tradition. So thank you, Kasike. Um, I'm just going to share the screen and then I hopefully will share the screen and then There we go. Um, okay, so uh, I've been asked today to provide the initial background context for the uh, Spanish Taino engagement in Jamaica. And I'm going to do that ultimately through the uh, lens of the Taino village of Maima, a site adjacent to the first Spanish colony of Sevilla, La Nueva, in St. Anne's Bay. Uh, this is a site that uh, as you heard from Ivor, that uh, Robin and I and Ivor uh, have worked on, uh, in particular, uh, conducting archaeological investigations in 2014 and 2015. At the outset, I will say that our work at Maima tells us two things. First, the early Spanish encounter with the Taino was abrupt and catastrophic, one described by Spanish historian Morales Padron as resulting in a rapidly descending curve of the Taino people. The second outcome was a realization that we know uh, quite little of early 16th century Jamaican Taino society. The Spanish chronicles in Jamaica are all but silent for the Taino, requiring us to use Spanish accounts in Hispaniola and elsewhere to inform on the archeological record. That, as the Maima data suggests, uh, could be problematic. May 5th, 1494, Christopher Columbus first encountered Jamaica and its indigenous people, uh, peoples in a North Coast harbor renamed Santa Gloria. By consensus today, this is St. Anne's Bay. The event was not without trepidation, given large numbers of canoes incorporating, incorporating spear-carrying warriors in black paint and with brightly colored headdresses. Columbus went on to explore the northern coastline further, um, careening his vessels uh, in Puerto, Be in Puerto uh, Buena, uh, an area or a, a bay that we now know is Discovery Bay. Uh, and there he claimed Jamaica for the Spanish crown. Columbus returned to Santa Gloria on the 25th of June, 1503, during his fourth and final voyage. He had been forcibly dislocated from central Panama by its indigenous peoples, and his remaining ships were in severe disrepair. In reaching St. Anne's Bay, um, neither the Capitana nor Santiago were seaworthy, being pulled ashore and beached. Here he spent the next year uh, not being rescued until June 29th, 1504. The Admiral's 13-year-old son, Ferdinand, was with him in Jamaica for that year. The few notes that exist about consequential events are provided by him, as well as the later testimony of Diego Mendez, the clerk of the fleet who engineered the Columbus rescue. What we do know is that the ships were beached close to the village of Maima, and that the Taino here were essentially to the Spanish for provision of supplies. Their eventual neglect led to Columbus's now infamous threat, having pre-knowledge of the lunar eclipse for February 29th, 1504, he gathered the caciques on that evening and threatened to darken the moon, to cast them into everlasting darkness. Not long after, uh, supply lines were quickly, quickly reestablished. We are left without a physical description of Maima. 
nor the name of its cacique, suggesting the village was part of a larger polity under a regional paramount. The village, though, is specifically identified by Ferdinand as being a quarter league distant from the ships, a measure equal to 1.4 kilometers. And on this slide, you can see uh, one of the areas that we worked at, uh, the, the most eastern part of the Mayima village, and it's exactly 1.4 kilometers to an area that we would uh, probably expect uh, the ships to have been beached in, so very, very close. Diego Columbus, the eldest son of Christopher, was appointed governor of the Indies in 1508, 1508 while, while also inheriting land rights to Jamaica after the Admiral's death in 1506. Almost immediately, he established the Jamaican colony of Sevilla La Nueva in St. Anne's Bay, a decision no doubt predicated on his father's insights into the area. Juan de Esquivel, the 60 men consequentially were assigned, uh, was assigned the task in 1509. I leave the story of, of New Seville to Robin. I reference it here, however, as the beginning point for one of the most devastating chapters uh, in Jamaican history. The colony, the colony was established less than 800 meters from the village of Sevilla. Um, uh, uh, where are we? The colony was established less than 800 meters from the village of Maima. We assume there to, there to have been an almost instantaneous impact. The Spanish chronicles are again silent on the details of these initial years in Sevilla, La Nueva leaving Morales Perdron to concede the story to the realm of archaeology. And he does this in his uh, volume on Spanish uh, Jamaica. Um, and here, uh, I've just uh, incorporated a map that illustrates the site of uh, Maima, the village of Maima, Maima uh, and some of the, uh, the known uh, archaeological uh, sites uh, that compose, um, compose the uh, the colony of Sevilla La Nueva. Uh, and I'll let Robin speak to the uh, bottom slide, the reconstruction of, of Sevilla La Nueva in 1525. Um, it's not exactly the way that we would uh, draw it up if it, if it were based on uh, the archaeological record. Juan de Esquivel was a close ally of the Columbus family, arriving in Hispaniola in 1502. In 1504, he had led the Spanish assault and slaughter of the Taino at Higüey, resulting in complaints to the crown. His actions in Jamaica seemed predetermined. In 1511, he implemented an encomienda system, giving individual colonists a quota of Taino laborers for their use. In return, the Taino were to be given religious instruction. In 1512, the Taino revolted, many relocating into mountains areas. Esquivel apprehended the caciques as retribution and as a lesson. Bartolome de la Casas describes the event as having outrageous cruelty, uh, including murder, burning, and exposing men to be torn to pieces by dogs. A Spanish brick from the excavations of the butchery in Sevilla and Nueva is a vivid reminder of the Spanish mastiff and their use in the Spanish con conquest of indigenous peoples uh, in the Americas. And here we can see the, the paw print uh, impressed into the Spanish brick, and it's, uh, it's really quite a, a sizable paw print. So this is a very massive uh, dog. As part of the overall program for Sevilla La Nueva, we decided to re-examine the archaeological context for Maima, as it might reflect an early 16th century Taino-Spanish interaction. <clears throat> the site originally had been identified by Charles Cotter, with uh, later test excavations in uh, 1982 by a Spanish team in support of the Columbus Quincentenary planning efforts that were uh, ongoing at the time. Our initial survey and test excavations found, found far more than expected. Maima is a large site extending well over a hectare on the upper slopes and terraces above 
the coastal plain. The site is bisected by a gully with the western segment integrated within a contemporary village on untitled lands. And here, the slide at the, uh, at the top, on the top left-hand side, uh, illustrates uh, test excavations we were undertaking in, in that village. The eastern segment, as illustrated uh, in the map, occurs within the Seville Heritage Park. Beyond size, the Taino settlement is notable for its well-laid-out settlement plan, employing artificial terracing, house platforms, a potential water management system, and in the case of Maima West, um, archaeological integrity. In 2015, we excavated two of the houses and put test excavations into others. And uh, this map uh, illustrates uh, the western part of the Maima site as we were able to map it in. Uh, platforms, only we've been able to record uh, 12 residential locations uh, at the site. And the depressions are uh, possibly part of a, a sort of a water management system and uh, may in fact uh, have been part of the, the house gardens associated with, uh, with these different, uh, different residential features. Our house excavations anticipated a mixed collection of Spanish Taino material culture, at least for the initial years of Sevilla La Nueva. We had hypothesized some type of exchange where materials of use to the Taino, especially metal and glass, would have been acquired. We did find these items, but they were exceptionally rare. In fact, beyond a few additional nails and a couple of sheet bone fragments, the entire assemblage for the illustrated house, it's the house on the right, is displayed uh, in the slide. And this is the house 10 excavation. You can see it's a center uh, pole, uh, uh, circular structure. The door would be um, to the, uh, the left-hand side, um, uh, um, basing onto a, a platform uh, made out of uh, marl and limestone rock. Um, so from this uh, excavation, uh, from the house floor in this excavation, uh, we were able to uh, recover these few bits of uh, evidence for the Italian and Spanish interaction, a couple of pieces of glass, uh, uh, a uh, nail, uh, an object, not quite certain whether it's a metal object, and of course, uh, roof tile, Spanish, a piece of Spanish roof tile that looks like it may have been used as, a, as an abrasive stone. Uh, and uh, from the second house floor excavation, uh, the uh, historic materials or the Spanish materials were even more scarce, um, being restricted to a single glass rod uh, and a cow molar. So not a lot of uh, Spanish material uh, in, this, uh, in this site. The excavations at Maima illustrate a rapid abandonment of the village where valuable materials appear to, appear to have been left behind in situ on the house floor. Um, there is no indication, however, of conflict or forced abandonment. Uh, I can only conclude that within a year or two of Spanish arrival, the village population had moved on. Given Esquivel's Encomienda 1511, that should not be at all surprising. Unable to address original questions concerning the early Spanish Taino engagement, the archeological record from Maima was nevertheless spectacular, adding to and clarifying aspects of the white marl phase as defined in Jamaican archeology. span The excavation of residential features was truly informative. For the first time in Jamaica, in fact, the Caribbean, we were able to document artificial terraces built out from a slope for house construction, much as you can see in the slide of the Taino, Taino Village Interpretive Center uh, in Cuba. The house excavations we undertook also illustrated circular stu structures defined by post holes with diameters in the 10 to 12 square meter range. These are extremely small houses, uh, particularly in comparison to this uh, reconstructed village uh, in 
uh, Cuba, but also in comparison to what we know about residential features in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and uh, also in Hispaniola. And most curious of all, uh, the vertebrate faunal assemblage from Maima was dominated, uh, it was very, very small, but it was dominated by uh, small fish. Well, the shellfish component seemed negligible given the almost 1,000 years of occupation at the site. Uh, and from this, we have to infer that there was almost a, a complete reliance on fruit, food crops as, as the central component of subsistence uh, economy. In comparing these aspects of Maima to interpretations based on Taino settlement in Hispaniola or Puerto Rico, the Maima data stand in marked contrast. The generalized ethnographic present constructed for Taino and Greater Antilles thus seems a, a rather poor fit. As Morales Padron stated for Sevilla Nueva, any understanding of Jamaican Taino society at the time of early Spanish colonization, at least in terms of the structure of its settlements, may, fully, may fall fully in the realm of Jamaican archeology. span The Taino population of Jamaica in 1494 has been estimated This is numbers. I have provided only the beginning context for by all accounts, what became a devastating century for indigenous peoples throughout the Caribbean. Indeed, it is hard to think that within the next half century, the Taino were reduced to all but negligible numbers across the island of Jamaica. Certainly, the Spanish effort, efforts through encomienda and other atrocities had its impact. Yet it is hard to see how such a small group of colonists could affect such a massive population and societal collapse. We can only assume that introduced disease as became the case throughout the Americas, was a critical vector. I wanted to end today with an image of the Jamaican coat of arms, a symbolic depiction honoring Jamaica's indigenous Taino people. Taino villages such as Maima are the archives through which their legacy can be written. In the face of contemporary development and all of the other things uh, ongoing in the modern world, Jamaican archeology span has its work cut out for it in the years to come. And uh, just a few uh, images of some of the artifacts recovered from that house tent, um, house floor. Um, and these, I guess we would put into the realm of curiosities, um, though um, I think they're uh, fairly obvious uh, as adornos, at least the ceramic bits as adornos. Uh, and the um, one in the bottom right uh, possibly related um, to some sort of ritual purpose uh, that's po possibly a semi. And that is uh, my presentation for today. So thank you for attending and thank you for listening. And I'll just get right out of the screen here if I can. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Burley. Thank you so much for providing that, that specific perspective coming from, coming out of Maima. Uh, Professor Woodward, uh, you're now up. Uh, uh, you have time. Share your screen. I think you also have uh, slides that you would like to uh, to to share as well. Yeah, great. Uh, hopefully, this will start. Can you see me now? Not not uh, your screen yet. We're still seeing your uh, your your chat. I think that's the case. Okay. Uh, very nice background. Can you see this now? Perfect, Robin. Yeah, and if you make that full screen, that should take up uh, our screens. Perfection. Thank you. Great. And welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to uh, share some of my research at Sevilla Nueva with a wider audience. And thank you, Reverend Cotter, for joining us this morning. It was a pleasure to hear from you after so long last week. For many of the indigenous cultures encountered in the Americas by the Renaissance voyages of discovery, and particularly those on the islands of the Caribbean, the arrival of the Europeans on their shores, as Dave has just explained, led to a rapid uh, demographic collapse and cultural transformations. Introduction of European diseases, 
violent confrontations, enslavement, and crown-sanctioned forced labor was the end result of these initial contacts between the old and the new worlds. But to just simplify these initial encounters into narratives of conquest and devastation, I think is to ignore the profound social and cultural changes that these encounters triggered in the lives of both the indigenous peoples and that of the European settlers. Over the past 60 years, historical and archeological research has explored both indigenous and European responses to the issues of cultural survival and continuity. Uh, resistance and power negotiations, accommodation, acculturation and transculturation, both in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the Americas. This research has illustrated that there was a significant, uh, significant variation in the types of responses by both these groups, depending on the time, the geographic setting, and the context of these intercultural encounters. During our research at Seville and Aueva, we both explored the transformation of the Iberian material culture, social practices, and diets in the households of the elite and non-elite Spanish residents, as well as the concurrent social adjustments and resistance to the Iberian colonizing efforts that occurred at Maima. Briefly, for those of you not familiar with the early Spanish history of Jamaica, as <clears throat> the island and Seville and Nueva in particular, as Dave has explained, is intimately linked to that of the Columbus family itself. Uh, Columbus came to Santa Gloria in, uh, for his first, on his second voyage for the first time in May 1494, and then returned at the end of his fourth voyage for a prolonged, unplanned uh, year-long stay in 1503 when he lived, uh, was marooned and lived atop his uh, two small sinking ships there. In 1508, <coughs> Diego Colon, Columbus's son, became the governor of the Indies and a year later dispatched 60 men under the command of Juan de Esquivel to occupy the island. And knowing that there was a good supply or a large population of friendly Taino uh, and a good anchorage in St. Anne's Bay, Esquivel chose this site for the first Spanish capital. He named it Seville and Nueva because he was a native, or New Seville, because he was a native of Sevilla in Spain himself. And it was Juan de Esquivel who first introduced the European crop of sugar, as well as a number of European livestock, uh, sheep, cattle, chickens, and pigs in particular. The history of the first Spanish capital of Jamaica sadly parallels that of many early 16th Spanish uh, colonial towns and colonies within the Circum-Caribbean in, in that their existence was uh, tenuous and short-lived. Uh, the fate of many of these contact era towns really was dependent on their, not only their ability to sustain themselves, uh, but also develop an economy that was of benefit to the uh, Spanish crown. But more importantly, as is in the case of Seville and Nueva, it was dependent on the whims of men. Columbus's stay on Jamaica, after that, the Spanish realized that the island uh, really did lack viable reserves of precious metal. However, it has fertile soil, a windward location, and geographic proximity to Central America. Therefore, Jamaica was envisioned as the supply base then uh, for the colonized, those uh, who were involved in the conquest of uh, the mainland. The early colonizing efforts of Esquiville uh, led to a sudden influx of colonists who were involved in agriculture, ranching, and the building trades, and the investments in sugar production and other business activities by Francesco de Garay, the second governor of the island, were particularly important, and then later the evil machinations of the island's treasurer, Pedro de Mazuelo, uh, shaped the destiny of the colony and led to its abandonment in 1534. Even though Seville and Nueva existed only for 25 years. Over the past 80 years, archaeological investigations of the site have demonstrated that the remains of the 16th century Spanish town 
are as intensive as they extensive as they are diverse, and in many cases very well preserved, albeit somewhat deeply buried. As you can see, the first um, item found was the Spanish fort in 19. Uh, 37, and it probably resembled uh, the Fort of San Sebastian on the island of La Gomera with its brick corners and rubble-filled uh, walls that it has. And it was extensively excavated in the 1950s and 60s by Charles Cotter and was the subject of my MA. The sugar mill uh, was also discovered by Charles Cotter, and it is the earliest known sugar mill in the New World and is the subject of my PhD study. Brick making operations were found in 2004 quite close to the mill, and uh, beside that was an extensive sculpture or mason's workshop, which I found in 2002. The green is the limestone, carved limestone blocks sitting on brick pavements, and the blue is all the plaster that we found there. This was the workshop uh, that produced the beautiful architectural decorations that were found in the governor's fortress and also were destined for the abbey, the latter of which was still under construction when the city was abandoned in 1534, as was the shop with its half-done sculpture. This is uh, the butchery discovered by Dave Burley and studied by him. And beside that, I found a uh, small house, Spanish house with a barrel well. And uh, all the little red X's is where we put auger holes uh, and looked for other Spanish remains. We found a number of brick pavements in that field south of the highway at this time. The abbey is located way up on the hill outside of what we know as the, the known part of the settlement. It was originally rediscovered by Father Francis Osborne in 1978, looked at by the Spanish team in 1987, and as I found in 2014, actually has extensive foundations, uh, which you can see in the top part of this slide. Enough that we could, these are some of the proposed reconstructions that I've been working on. And a lot of this is also based on the detailed description of this beautiful building uh, done by Hans Sloan in the late uh, 17th century. Historical records uh, indicate that the indigenous people uh, were present and worked throughout the Spanish colony here uh, under the forced sy uh, labor system of the encomienda in which the crown granted uh, Spanish settlers uh, a restricted set of property rights over a certain number of Indians. You got more if you were uh, more important. And certainly these Indians were used for laborers, either in the mining or construction, transportation, and in the case of Jamaica, certainly for farming. Uh, the Spanish were entitled to extract tribute uh, from uh, these laborers in the form of goods, perhaps precious metals, labor services, and this was all in exchange for instructions in the Catholic religion, which was of course to make them into civilized beings. The archeological excavation at the site of Seville and Nueva has produced thousands of artifacts representing uh, materials from various workshops, a mill, as well as elite and non-elite households that along with the archival sources augment our understanding not only of Spanish colonial uh, life, but of the role of the Taino in the workforce of this town and suggest that far from being sort of passive participants in this colonial enterprise, they engaged really in a range of friendly and antagonistic social and material relationships, including intermarriage, cooperation, perhaps trading, fleeing, as Dave uh, has uh, explained, and outright resistance. The historic records indicate that in the early years of colonization, the Spanish really preferred to uh, and attempted to maintain all of their Iberian social and cultural identities with regards principally to social hierarchy, material culture, and diet. And certainly the use of familiar objects gave the Spanish settlers a sense of security, which was important mostly to the young men coping, being far from home, possibly for the first time, living in a new environment, and certainly encountering unfamiliar cultures. The high cost of the tin glazed uh, maiolicas and the limited space to transport uh, both either fine ceramics or glass to the new world 
uh, uh, serve to really limit the distribution of these items among the colonists relative to their social and economic positions. So therefore, the, uh, the limited availability of European table and storage wares, however, didn't really negate the, their necessity to the Spanish, uh, and they were forced to use uh, locally uh, produced equivalents <clears throat> from, uh, that they could um, get in the New World. So they uh, had the fortress area and in the house in Area 6 in the sugar mill, 60%, uh, at least 60% of the ceramics were actually Taino in construction. Not only does this signal that the Spanish, yes, at Seville and Nueva did use locally fabricated wares for utilitarian functions in their household uh, and places of work, but certainly in the case of the governor's fortress, uh, where the, most of the beautiful Spanish wares were found around the well and near the uh, deposit of uh, fine carvings in the larger room one, clearly the, the principal room of the house, while the Taino ceramics were found in the cellar and in the refuge uh, sort of areas uh, outside of room two, uh, along with the faunal remains, indicates that this was probably the area where the cooking was done. And that certainly, um, this also probably indicates the presence of Taino uh, women serving in the households in some form of domestic role. Certainly that was the, the smaller room was where food was prepared. Taino food preparation and technology and foodstuffs, I think are probably the most important aspects of the indigenous life ways that were incorporated into the 16th century Spanish colonial uh, culture in the Caribbean. Certainly at the time of conquest or uh, arrival in 1492, the Taino had uh, developed a, a very sophisticated form of agriculture that was based on root crops, principally the cassava or manioc plant and sweet potatoes. Once harvested though, the cassava had to be meticulous, meticulously processed to make it edible. So you had to grate it, uh, you had to, um, to pound it, to wash it, and grind it into flour, uh, which they then the Taino mixed with water to make sort of these pancake forms, and then they were grilled on ceramic, thick ceramic uh, griddles as shown below here that were called burins. The cooking process uh, did, evap uh, did help to get rid of uh, the poisonous acid that the cassava contained. And wheat doesn't grow in the humid uh, Caribbean condition, so the Spanish, uh, Spanish were forced to incorporate cassava bread into their daily diet. It was known as the bread of the Indies. It's not only high in calories, which was good, but it also stored for months, therefore making it suitable for shipboard use by the Spanish. Early documents refer uh, uh, that cassava bread was accepted by the Spanish as tribute payments, which kind of infers that it was made in, in the native village and then given to the Spanish. Certainly the presence of cassava griddles though has shown up in all of the Spanish settlements in the Caribbean. And a lot of researchers have uh, given this as evidence of the Taino women being present in Spanish households in some sort of domestic, uh, uh, arrangement, either as wives or servants. As Jamaica's role, however, grew as a producer of foodstuffs uh, to support the conquest of Central America and Mexico in particular, cassava bread must have produced, been produced someplace close to Seville and Nueva on an almost industrial scale because court documents uh, sh state that after leaving Cuba in 1519, Hernan Cortez sent three, I had three ships, one of which he dispatched to Jamaica uh, uh, with supplies from Spain in exchange for 800 slabs of bacon and 2,000 cargas of cassava bread. Um, and depending on where you are in the Spanish Empire, because weights weren't uh, the equivalent and the time, that's anywhere from 100 to 200 tons of cassava bread that Cortez needed for his troops. The role of the Taino women as, a, as domestics was certainly further evidenced by the presence of shell scrapers in the fortress, um, at the fortress, and these are hardly things the Spanish would have used. And I should emphasize there is no evidence of pre contact uh, Taino, Taino occupation of that coastal plain where the Spanish established their settlement. 
Certainly, uh, locally produced ceramics, uh, Taino ceramics, were widely obviously used by the Spanish for cooking wares, and is evidence from this very unique style of colono ware that was found in the Cotter collection. Native potters were also organized to produce ceramics directly for the Spanish uh, town. There are 32 sherds of uh, what we call St. Anne's Bay ware, and uh, seven of them were complete vessels. And uh, the, the presence really of this syncretic Hispanic Indian ware demonstrates a degree of cultural adaptation that has only appeared at very few Spanish sites in the Caribbean and uh, never in this particular form. Now, this ware is uh, hand produced in a hand coiled manner, the same as the Taino ware. It's exactly the same paste as the white marl uh, ceramics. And really its appearance in the Iberian households suggests that native potters had, were expanding their traditional repertoire to include new vessel forms that were really more usable and suitable for both for Spanish tastes and uses. Unfortunately, the various work processes the Taino men uh, labored at in the industrial precinct of Seville and Oueva leave very little in the way of material culture to illustrate their presence, save a few number of lithic uh, blades, which I'm very glad to report Ivor helped me identify, uh, this tiny little piece of a, of a zemi, and a couple of fish weights. Therefore, the contributions really of the enslaved Taino men are kind of muted in the archeological record, but at least some of the archival documents really state that they worked in the mill, they worked in the quarry, uh, um, chopping and carrying stones, and they worked in the construction of the abbey. Uh, and Padrone and Father Osborne document that for us. There was, however, glass beads found. All of these were documented and found at the sugar mill site. Uh, at Seville and Nueva, and it really demonstrates that not all of the labor was coerced or done by enslaved men, as beads were typically traded to indigenous people in exchange for services and goods. Um, the analysis of the uh, Iberian material culture from the industrial quarter, I think, includes the sugar molds and some metal tools and evidence of larger tools and demonstrates that the Spanish certainly uh, brought with them all the necessary expertise, as well as equipment from Europe to reproduce um, both the Iberian construction materials that they needed and sugar producing technology. Raw materials needed for bricks, plaster, dressed and decorated limestone um, blocks could all be sourced uh, locally quite close to Sevilla, La Nueva. So therefore there is little uh, sort of evidence that the Spanish had to employ adaptive strategies or innovations, at least in their working lives, where it was really important as the sort of the public life they displayed, that they retained their cultural traditions and really the appearance of being Spanish. However, certainly in their domestic settings, especially in the private areas uh, where the cooking was done, it is evident that the uh, Spanish settlers quickly had to adapt to the realities of their new tropical environment and being far from home. So that's just a little flavor of some of the research we've been doing at Seville and Nueva, and I'm sure that Dave and I are open uh, to questions at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Woodward. And I want to give now the opportunity to uh, Dr. Connolly to provide some concluding thoughts, uh, any type of summary before we, we address uh, uh, questions, comments from the audience. And I, and I see one in the chat right now that we can begin with. But uh, Dr. Connolly, at, uh, uh, I'm giving you the floor. Okay, thank you, Zach. Uh, let me just say, Dave and Robin have given us uh, an, an in-depth review of that early Spanish period, and that is very invaluable. Uh, you know, we need to know more about the Jamaican Taino. So often, because more research has been done in other places in the Caribbean, uh, we automatically presume that the Tainos in Jamaica were somewhat similar to those places, Tainos in those places. Well, this research on terracing has told us that perhaps the, the townships were 
not quite the same. They're not quite laid out the same way. And um, Dave has sort of tweaked our interest with a number of things that we need to investigate. We need to investigate further. It takes us in other directions. I mean, the revolt of 1512, all these house spots that we've been finding. Um, you know, we, we oftentimes focus a lot on the African period and uh, not so much on the China period in terms of rebellions. And perhaps this is opening a door for us, for us to do more work in that area. Kasike, hey, hey, how about that? Um, so folks, um, over back to you, Zach, thank you. All right, Dr. Connolly, appreciate it. Look, now uh, I wanna provide the opportunity to audience members. We are. We scheduled this between 11 and 1 Jamaican time. Uh, likely we will, you know, we'll, we're going to see what questions, comments there are, but by, uh, but by all means, we'll, we can also end a little bit ahead of the, the 1 o'clock hour. So by all means, please add questions in the chat or indicate your desire to, to uh, have yourself unmuted so you can speak over the mic. Uh, I do see a, a, a question from from uh, Peregrine Bryant that uh, if I'm able to Peregrine, I will, uh, I will read uh, with the idea that Ivor, Robin, Dave, whoever's best suited for this question can respond. Uh, so do we imagine that the Spanish Masons might have trained up Taino craftsmen and that some of the carving might have included some work by their hands? I, I assume that goes over to Robin, but uh, I'll let you all. Certainly, I think it's evidence uh, from the documents that this uh, that the Taino were trained to do the quarrying work, the heavy work, sort of bringing, uh, uh, quarrying out the blocks and certainly taking them down. There is an area at the workshop where all the debitage is, uh, or the larger parts of debitage, where the blocks were sort of roughly squared up. And certainly, I imagine that the Taino did that. The act the process of, of building the church um, went on for 10 years. Certainly craftsmen must have been there maybe a little bit before that uh, to do some of the decorations at the fortress. To become trained up to do the fine quality of the plateresque sculpture that is there, and it really is uh, quite fine, that was a fairly new style of sculpture even at that time in Spain, uh, a style that had come over from uh, the Renaissance uh, sort of Italy uh, is um, would have taken 10 or 12 years of sort of uh, an apprenticeship and journeyman uh, sort of activity. So I'm not sure that, and certainly the European craftsmen would have had an idea of what those images look like having grown up going to churches and seen it in Spain before they got there. So to not have any idea of the imagery and then be able to do such fine sculpture, I'm not sure that uh, the Taino would have been totally trained up to do any of that fine work. But uh, certainly we did find small clay models of what then appeared in much larger sizes on the block. So that's obviously what the master was doing and showing to his apprentices uh, uh, he was giving them three-dimensional models for what they were supposed to carve up on uh, the blocks themselves. But so certainly the quarrying, the the making of the building blocks. But I'm they may have been started the training process, but I don't think they would have completed it by the time that the Spanish left the site. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Um, and I don't want to cut Dave or, or or Ivor if you've got anything else to say to that, please. Please follow up, and I, Robin, I would just like to take the opportunity in terms of the imagery. Uh, what uh, this combination of Spanish iconography and and indigenous Amerindian symbols and scenes. Wh what what did you have the opportunity to see with your own eyes about? I guess this creative you know, combination or or the input from either side beyond labor roles in terms of the the actual. Uh, icons that were shown on these carved stone blocks. Well, it's interesting to me that all of the plant life that is depicted on the blocks 
uh, are acanthus leaves, fig leaves. Um, the fruits are European fruits, uh, not native fruits. There's, there's figs, there's citrus fruits, there's grapes, there's wheat. Um, all of these are European symbols. None of it is uh, symbols of local flora and fauna at all. The two uh, ladies on one of the stones that sort of digress into acanthus leaf scrolls, those are very uh, antique Roman actually in uh, depiction. You see a lot of that on uh, the, the Platerish style is modeled after some of the uh, Roman material, classical Roman material that had been found. Uh, those, uh, the style is exactly like the antique Roman grotesques, and those are all found on Renaissance grotesques. So it's not, none of it that I saw uh, is particularly Taino. Maybe some of the models of the women's faces could have been Taino, uh, but because there wasn't a lot of women uh, Spanish uh, settlers there, uh, but certainly all of the flora and fauna and the iconography is European in derivation. None of it is uh, is from uh, the the local sources. That's good to know, Robin. I wasn't I wasn't actually aware of what not only transplanting your 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 people, your culture, uh, your your settlement patterns, but also uh, your your symbols of plants and and. Uh, human life. But thank you. We've got one question from Pauline Kolstad. Was it a, a Franciscan or a Domin uh, Dominican Abbey? Um, I'm I'm thinking that the uh, it was actually a Frances uh, Francescan one, and that's based okay. on Father Osborne's book that said the Francescans uh, were the ones that were there. And certainly, one of the three figures, three dimensional figures that we have, is actually of Saint Francis. So. All right, thank you. Any other questions I'm not seeing in the chat? I'm also not seeing any hands raised. I, I guess I will direct towards Dave. I actually have a question for you, but please feel free to follow up. Have any, have any uh, domestic burials within terracing, perhaps middens at Myema, uh, uh, been discovered during, during your recent, recent work on site? Why I ask is based on my own recent experience at White Marl, this was a very what domestic space, a mortuary space, uh, you're, you're, you're taking care of your living needs and those needs in death right around the same area. So Dave, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Um, we've uh, done quite a bit of um, testing at the site, um, small scale testing in terms of using uh, bucket auger and systematically um, you know, going from one end of the, the site to the other. And, and to this point, no, we've not encountered uh, any human remains. Uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, preclude them from uh, being present. Uh, one of the things that uh, we didn't do is dig through, for example, all of these, uh, the two, well, we dug through uh, one, one house floor. Uh, the other one, we simply exposed the top of the, uh, of the, the house floor, and uh, we did test on one side of the the platform, so we know that the terrace uh, had, that had been built out to create the house platform was about a meter and a half thick on one side. Uh, there may be burials beneath those houses; uh, it's quite possible, but I uh, nothing in the way of of uh, human remains. Uh, one, of the th one of the things that I wanted to follow up on uh, relative to Robin's talk um, is the, the, the trans translocation of Spanish foodways. Um, it's really quite uh, amazing to uh, have excavated this, uh, what we interpret to be a butchery, uh, and find that uh, something like 80% of the faunal material, and it's, it's massive, the, the faunal collections, um, is sheep, uh, and I, you know, thinking about having you know large sheep herds early on in in the, the early 16th century uh, throughout Jamaica is just mind-boggling to me to think about it. Uh, but it's it's clearly sheep, unlike in Hispaniola, where where cattle uh, took off quickly and became you know, sort of the dominant um, one of the, one of the dominant uh, resources for uh, supplying. Uh, the Spanish, the Spanish colonies. So, thank you, Dave. 
Uh, Ivor, did you have uh, any anything to add on that and the, and the issues just raised by Dave? Uh, we've got a uh, we've got another question in the chat, and I see uh, 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 from an individual, but I, I just wanted to make sure, Ivor, do you have anything to add to food ways? Uh, no, but just to, just to reinforce Dave's point that um, burials may be there. I mean, at White Mall, we we go through that mall layer, and that's where you find the burials, so it's possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ivor. So we've got a, uh, from my friend, Dr. Alice Sampson at University of Leicester. Uh, she's, she's complimenting on the, the quality of the talks, wonderful. Uh, uh, providing a question focused on cultural resistance. And I'm, I'm just going to read this, Alice, and I apologize. I'm going to look at both your comments. The relative lack of Spanish material at Maima compared to the abundance of indigenous materials in Spanish towns is similar to Deegan and Cruchan's findings from Hispaniola sites of Enbasalin and the Spanish site, uh, colonial site of Puerto Real. This seems like a real, this seems uh, similar to what we see in Hispaniola site of El Cabo, San Rafael, indigenous site with minimal Spanish material and abandonment shortly after contact wonderful archipelic uh, parallels. So perhaps not a, not, a, not a specific question, but I think encouraging based on the need for further research into the Spanish, world, uh, Spanish Caribbean world around comparisons between uh, what indigenous contact we heard Robin mentioned, sites in Dominican Republic, uh, but also needing to be aware that more studied islands such as Hispaniola can't necessarily provide all our answers uh, to the Jamaican experience, right? Uh, and I think this discussion about the emergence of a syncretic wear within the confines of Sevilla La Nueva shows us that there's considerable societal cultural change going on. Perhaps, Dave, that we'll, we'll see zemis in the forms of sheep faces or, you know, uh, <laughs> Spanish imagery and, you know, Spanish. Uh, stone carvings incorporating later Taino cultural uh, iconography. So that's, that's, you know, some ideas there. Any other follow-ups from people in the chat who want to, uh, or people that want to take over the mic, but I'm also providing ongoing opportunities to our contributors to, to, to continue this conversation. Well, I think it's interesting, certainly from Morales Padron's work and some of uh, the work that Father Osborne um, has, has also found, is that the Taino seem to have existed in uh, Jamaica for quite a bit longer than the documents suggest on some of the other islands. They were certainly still there in, some, uh, in a few numbers and villages in the mountains uh, on the, in, in the eastern section right through to the beginning of the 17th century, um, they're mentioned still in documents that there's Indian villages. So um, certainly I think uh, the encomienda in that Aunt Jamaica, it was involved, where people were involved in ranching and farming may have been less stressful certainly on the Taino populations than in the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico where they were involved in mining, which was some, an activity that they weren't used to certainly farm is something that they did do and maybe less stressful. Certainly uh, as Dave's research and everybody else's research has shown, they took off to the mountains as quickly as they could, but, uh, uh, but uh, to be involved in farming may have been less stressful and therefore led to uh, their being around a bit longer. And all two, two good questions in the chat, one from our uh, uh, former president, uh, Dr. Susan Francis Brown. And I think this is probably Dave, Ivor, but, but Robin, no doubt as well. What would have been the socio-political context within which Maima fell in terms of the Taino population of Jamaica? So collapse, I guess. The contours of collapse, Dave, what do you think? From the lack of description and the, I mean, we, we do have, uh, a little bit of understanding of, you know, sort of Columbus's interaction with uh, the, the folks at Maima. But it's, it's really difficult to say. I mean, we assume that Jamaica would have incorporated a number of different chiefdoms, each with a, a uh, paramount uh, head uh, with, uh, you know, widely 
the groups of villages under under which um, you know, under which they they would be uh, aggregated. Um, and so the, the, the fact that uh, there's no record of a, of a pr particular cacique uh, related um, to the village itself, but we do have the names of other cacique recorded in the, in the Spanish uh, chronicles who are um, you know, no doubt uh, higher up on the, in, in terms of the uh, socio-political uh, level. Um, we, I would think, I mean, and perhaps I'm wrong, um, Maima is probably one of these subservient smaller, uh, smaller settlements, but I, you know, it would take a whole lot more work to uh, sort out, and particularly in the uh, part of the uh, village um, that's now in the, you know, sort of in the western part of the, the site that's um, being very heavily disturbed by uh, by that, by the, the village that's over there now, and the people that are living uh, on that on that site, um, we did not find any evidence, for example, for a ball court. Uh, we have uh, nothing that you know that would be uh, spectacular, at least in terms of the archaeological materials we excavated. That would uh, you know that would illustrate um, you know some sort of uh, major. Uh, paramount uh, living there. So I'm, I, you know, my impressions or interpretations would be that it's, it's probably one of these smaller uh, settlements tied into a larger, uh, a larger polity. Ivor, yeah, I, I bet you I've have done some preliminary that, uh, work on, on provinces and um, noted that the, based on um, stylistic variation in pottery, you have Green Castle, out um, near Anata Bay on the north coast of Jamaica, uh, ranging through Cranbrook and Fairfield. There are three distinct, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, provinces. And the Maima, Maima decorations on the, on the lip of pottery matches those of Cranbrook. So I would imagine that we're looking at provinces uh, Cranbrook and Maima would be tied in to the same area. Of course, until you really do some counts of, you know, the, this pottery, you won't be able to confirm that. But there's an indication, one of the complete pots that were uh, located by Robin and Dave on, on the Maima site uh, has shown a pattern similar to the Cranbrook pattern. So that's, you know, that would mark some socio-political maybe change over time. Yeah, and I and I, I were to follow up with that. I think the experience faced by Maima and I, I think Robin and Dave have also described this. That initial contact zone settlement area on the north coast. The work that we've been doing recently at White Marl is showing even the potential of ongoing settlement at that site. Between, I mean, we had one burial radiocarbon dated. Uh, uh, between AD 1488 all the way up to 1645. That may seem like a, a big date range, but it, it's within the range of, you know, uh, continuity at least across another generation or two in, in, in indigenous Jamaica. So the experience at Maima most, most certainly informs, but doesn't necessarily what, uh, reflect the entire, entire scenario of what's, what's going on in Jamaica. Thank you for, for raising that issue. Thank you for the question, Suzanne. We now have Benoit. Thank you, Benoit, for your question. Uh, what is the date of the arrival of the first African in Jamaica? Uh, and I guess specifically also bringing them home, well, bringing this question home to Sevilla La Nueva. And, and I'll leave that for, for Robin, Dave, and Ivor. Well, certainly uh, from some archival records actually in Spain relating to the Genoans in uh, the town uh, in the city of Sevilla, we know that uh, Francesco de Garay in 1515 purchased 10 Africans. Uh, presumably he brought them with him when he arrived in, in 1515. The Spanish were really slow and did their slave, uh, their African slave trade in a different manner than what came after. They brought a limited number of slaves, all of which were purchased at a high price. 
uh, they brought them to Spain to be Christianized and then uh, sometimes to the Canary Islands and then um, certainly to the New World after that. So there was, they in fact really limited the supply of Africans in the first sort of three or four decades of coming over. They made them quite expensive. And certainly from experience in the um, Canary Islands, we know that because the African slaves were so expensive, they were not wasted on field activities. They were trained to be craftsmen and to work in the mill or, or do other sort of household uh, type chores. The, uh, we also know that Pedro de Mazuelo also owned a number of African slaves. Uh, presumably they went to the south coast. But the tantalizing thing is one of the very small clay models we have, which is about this big, about uh, two inches across, um, is actually of a face of an African uh, with very wide sort of nose and African facial features. Uh, and so uh, sort of a tantalizing thing, they were certainly Africans at Seville and Nueva, but I don't think they would have been occupied in field type operations for the mill. I think they would have been uh, more working in the Mason's workshop or in a household context versus um, being out in the fields. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Benoit, for that question. We've got another question from Thomas, uh, and and you know Ivor definitely with your regional knowledge of the uh, you know and, and island wide knowledge perhaps this one is directed to you but Robin Dave by all means isn't there study isn't there study in uh, Saint Elizabeth indicating that the Taino were there for much longer until even until the English arrived well again I before we go into that even. Uh, Governor Sir Henry Morgan, right, in his probate record and his, his uh, will, we don't know if these are Tainos, it, and he dies in 1682, I think, it lists two, two Indians, right? So, I mean, the, this idea of continuity is, is likely, you know, expressed across a variety of, of different bits of evidence, and, and like Thomas is recognizing here, probably stands a chance uh, uh, better in certain regions. But, but Ivor, what do you think about St. Elizabeth? What's going on in St. Uh, Elizabeth? Well, I, I haven't dug uh, with that in mind in St. Elizabeth, but um, it's certainly possible. Um, at the Kent site in Trelawney, the border of Trelawney and St. James, and also at the Rain River site in St. Mary, uh, both those sites indicate contact between China and British, right? So certainly going into that post-16 British in period then, um, you know, the Chinese were still around then. So, St. Elizabeth, quite possibly, why not? Well, and, and thank you, Ivor. I don't know if Rob and Dave, I don't want to cut anybody off, but by all means, follow up that. And beyond archeology, span I mean, this quest for better understanding, not only the life ways in the past of Taino peoples in Jamaica, but their, but their ongoing cultural legacy and, and perhaps even biological legacy in contemporary Jamaican people. So this is gonna require uh, uh, advanced studies dealing with ancient DNA, uh, contemporary Jamaican DNA. So hopefully we can get that done. And I know we have Dr. Kendra Serac in the room right now from Harvard Medical School that I'm, I'm hoping will be able to assist uh, uh, us and, and the society in Jamaica and dealing with these type of questions. We do have another question though, all I'm trying to get everyone in on housing. This is coming from our social media manager of the ASJ, Angelique Mullings. What is the significance of the housing sizes found at Maima? How this, uh, how is this, should this change our understanding of Jamaican Taino family community life? Uh, so perhaps Dave, Ivor, uh, and, and even Robin, what do you think, houses and domestic life? Um, we've uh, published a paper in Latin American antiquity uh, dealing with this, and I have to say you had a, an earlier uh, comment by uh, Alice Sampson that she's done uh, the most comprehensive uh, survey of uh, residential features uh, throughout the Caribbean and, and uh, has uh, documented uh, house sizes and construction forms and, and so on. Uh, very uh, significantly. Um, and what we can say with certain, if, if in fact the Maima houses are representative of the 
uh, Jamaican Taino and the two other uh, residential features that we, we uh, believe or that have been documented uh, in uh, Jamaica are of an equivalent size, uh, then I think it has a, a fairly significant uh, reflection in terms of, of uh, the, the, the basic structure of uh, the Taino, uh, you know, sort of Taino society in terms of uh, small family group residential units, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of large houses with, with multifamily groups, uh, as has been recorded elsewhere. So I think it's the, the implications are there. Um, we just need to do more. I mean, we need to document more of these houses to see that we're in fact dealing with a pattern and not dealing with, you know, sort of isolated contexts in, in uh, a couple of a couple of the sites, well, actually three sites now in, in Jamaica. So um, perhaps Alice could could reflect on uh, what yeah. she thinks about that. And definitely, and Alice, if you did want to take over and reflect on your experience in, in, in DR, Hispaniola, elsewhere, please feel free. And obviously in Jamaica, the, the document, this is quite significant what David is talking about, because and Cora and Ivor back me up here, according to my knowledge, uh, there's only one other study that I can think of uh, coming out of White Marl that has actually identified Taino built environment, right? Uh, post holes, domestic spaces, you found tremendous amounts of artifacts, human remains at a site like White Marl, really not as much evidence in terms of housing. So it's, it's an important question and one that will require even, even more work. But, but Alice, I don't know if you're still in here. Yes, you are. Feel free if you want to add, add your thoughts. And sorry to put you on the spot, but it's a pleasure having you here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is certainly making the experience of like, these last few months are much more positive. I think that the events like this, which bring us together, even though we're like, you know, socially distanced from our, our near neighbors are really fantastic. And um, I really enjoyed those talks and learned a lot. Um, and just on the issue of houses, yes, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because of course, like uh, um, the, there is great diversity in house size across across the Caribbean, but there's certainly. Um, is she, is she uh, like, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, this, this, it's quite common that that, that 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 house diameters appear to be kind of less than ten meters, and so with we, I don't know what the kind of like it, uh, the household composition was, whether we're whether we're thinking about sort of small uh, intergenerational uh, household clusters. But what I think is really interesting is the longevity of these households. So some of the things that's coming out of uh, excavations across the archipelago, and I'd be interested to know if this is the case in, in Maima as well, is the fact that you have sort of what, what I've called house, household trajectories, whereby the same house is built again and again from generation to generation. Like, um, indicating that there is a uh, continuity in these households, regardless of composition, you know, whether these are like kin, whether there is some other kind of um, uh, relationship between members of a household, I don't know, and that some of these households form clusters. So you have clusters of households which perpetuate themselves kind of through time. And that right I find here. is sort of one of the, one of the really interesting observations that, that um, has come out of excavation, certainly in some of the French islands in, in Hispaniola. And so I'd be interested on, on your perspective on that in terms of um, the settlement at, at Maima. Thank you. Alice, thank you. Sorry to again put you on the spot, but always I love ever, it. No ever, <laughs> ever present. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, and, and look, it sounds like, you know, whether it's an edited volume, further talks, literally on house and home, house and heart in, in you know, pre-Columbian Caribbean, it sounds like we, we got something potentially to roll with here. Uh, let me roll on to our next question, uh, beyond housing. Thank you too, pa Paula, I think you've left. Uh, Rosemary Dodd, weren't Indians brought from South America to Jamaica? Hans Sloan talked about them, I believe. And I think Rosemary raises a very good point. In my own reading, uh, I think it's the mos uh, mosquito. Uh, uh, Indians of, I think it's Honduras, but someone can correct me there, that are brought over to Jamaica to, to, to fill in uh, labor positions, right? But uh, can, uh, 
please, Robin, Dave, Ivor, what do you think about Indians brought from South America to Jamaica and Hans Sloan's recollection of that? Uh, well, so, go ahead, Robin. I was going to say that certainly um, um, Henry Morgan and his group certainly collaborated a lot, uh, as did Sir Francis Drake, a lot with some of the Indian groups. And uh, they probably, uh, you know, it's very probable that uh, some of the ones that they collaborated with were, uh, that helped them get across, let's say, for, for Morgan and his team to, to Panama, that they would have come back on the ships with the English and, and certainly come to, uh, to Port Royal, that they would have brought extra, you know, uh, they would have been short sailors and stuff like that, that they would have brought people back um, on, on those ships. So very conceivable. And we know that Port Royal was a slave trading town. So uh, to capture some of the South American Indians and bring them back, certainly a possibility. And it does um, make for, I, go ahead. Can I say something here? Um, of course done, I am. Oh, I've done some research on that. Um, the the okay. Mosquito Indians also were purveyors of slaves from the inner end of Mexico. They brought in slaves who were mostly um, not necessarily Mayan, but of those peoples who lived in that area. And they were actually brought to the coast by the Mosquito Indians and sold to the English. So there was a active slave trade coming from also North America. There were also slaves from North America. And whenever um, there is one particular rebellion that happened with, I think, King Philip in North America and the Indians who were subdued by the English there were actually trans, they were carried to Jamaica and to Barbados as slaves. So there are several instances of Indians coming from other areas that were brought into the island. Diane, thank you for that. And look, this is a complicated scenario that, that uh, whether it's historical documents, archaeology, uh, may not be able to uh, properly sort out these layers of ind indigeneity in places like, like Jamaica. Uh, I've been, you know, there's obviously historical documentation about the movement of Jamaican Tainos to mining islands like Hispaniola. So I am really appealing for the assistance and uh, availability of, 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 of what will, what could aid us here is, is biological data, DNA evidence, in order ideally to be able to work out where individuals are coming from during this very transformative and uh, 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 conflicted times. Uh, we've got- I'd Add something here if you- Yes, Ivor, sorry, go ahead. Uh, in, in the pre-First Maroon War, Mosquito Indians were brought in to help to locate maroons and, um, and repair them. So you're looking at about 1725 What's that? through to 1728. Uh, quite a lot of Mosquito Indians would have been brought to Jamaica uh, to join with the British militia in um, subduing the maroons. And yes. They were, were paid for that. They were not. Um, Ivor, thank you for that. And I know that was an issue raised in the chat by Kasike Kalan. So uh, every, a number of people on the same page here. I'm now moving to another question. Uh, this is from Benoit. Uh, second question, does, does these early African Jamaicans uh, may have participated in the development of creolized material culture in New, New Sevilla? I think he's thinking, well, specifically thinking, Robin, about the, the lower presence of of low-fired coarse earthenware, Afro-Caribbean ware, Kelowna ware. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what he's thinking. What do okay, you think, so Robin? The St. Anne's Bay ware, and you know, I uh, there had been some questions raised uh, by Tony Aarons who, or, and Roderick Ebanks, who said, of course, this must have been made by the Africans. And uh, I spent a lot of time with those particular artifacts and uh, and Dr. Lee. And we concluded that, you know, the paste that they're made out of is exactly the same as the Taino white marl paste. Um, there are a few pieces that are 
much more sandy or grainy taste and they were the small bowls um, that had a ring foot added to them and of course Taino ware has rounded bottoms uh, and certainly the Spanish obviously didn't like their, their, their pottery rocking back and forth so they added a ring foot to those. Uh, whether that um, shows something to do with the Africans there that that paste is slightly different, it's got uh, a little bit of sand in it um, it's it's more sandy. It's low fired. Certainly, hand coiled pottery again, um, or just the Taino learning how to put grout in their in 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 their paste for sanding. I'm not sure, but for the most part, the uh, the identifiable pieces of Nusa Billware are made with white marl type paste in the same fashion that the Taino ceramics were. So, I'm thinking that they're mostly made by uh, the Taino people that were there. So, but certainly that, that more sandy paste stuff could have been done by the Africans. We're not sure. All right, thank you, Robin. I think Ivor could follow me up on this. I know at White Marl, I think it was in the Tyndall Bisco collection. Uh, it's in a early Robert Howard uh, article, I think from the 50s. Uh, uh, on Jamaican archaeology, and it's it's that same type of pitcher form recovered at at, at White Marl with a very much zoomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic face on the front of it, which may be an extension of this type of syncretic tradition into a into a settlement like White Marl. But it's so it's it's pretty limited limited evidence, but 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 definitely definitely telling. Uh, any other responses uh, among the panel? And obviously, keep feeding questions, guys. We got about 20 minutes or so left. This has been a very productive session thus far. Uh, but any any follow up about uh, and perhaps Ivor uh, indigenous uh, 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 African participation at uh, or involvement at at New Seville. But if not, we can roll on to another question if there are any remaining. But I'm not seeing any in the chat. Well, I don't Hi. want to cut any, anyone off. Hello? No, no, I was just going to say that, um, you know, there's always this issue as to whether um, it's Taino or, or African, you know, because uh, the type of wear uh, is similar. Um, and it's oftentimes the dates that one can use to determine whether it's African or Taino. But certainly when, you, when you're going earlier than 15, early 1500s, it's easy, it's Taino, but after that, it can get a little complicated. So as, as Robin said, I mean, you know, you have to look at the wear closely, uh, maybe x-ray diffraction, I don't know, maybe you have to find other means of, of finding if, if it's um, the Taino or otherwise. Thank you, Ivor. Uh, again, I want to open up opportunities for anyone else to answer, uh, ask a question, pose a comment. I do have one question for, for our panelists. This has to do with, with religion. I've all, all, often been very impressed with how the worldview, uh, 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 animistic belief systems of, uh, of Jamaican's indigenous people are literally baked into the everyday objects of life, of ceramics, of of portable material culture like like Zemis, we saw some of that in in Dave's and, and Robin's presentation with with Adornos. Uh, I, I'm hoping you can provide. We're, we're a very devout island. We're a very religious island in, in in Jamaica, and I think this notion, this idea of organized monotheistic or polytheistic religions. Uh, what is what is the material evidence at? at Maima, at Sevilla La Nueva, that we can, we can think more about religion and the collision of different religious beliefs. You want to start, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> it's chronologically. Hey, yeah, yeah, Dave. <laughs> you know, I was looking for a cave in the civil area. Anybody can help me to find a cave because I'm figuring if there's a cave somewhere around, maybe there are petroglyphs, maybe there are pictograms, and we can get an idea as to what the religion, you know, what was happening there, you know? Maybe there's a shrine, I don't know. If anybody, I've been searching for caves in that area, I've not been successful. I guess I was um, 
somewhat uh, surprised by the, you know, our finding these Adornos um, at, in, in the house floor, on, like literally in situ uh, in the house floor. But uh, equally important um, is that one uh, large cobble that I showed you, that sort of spiral, uh, that was sitting at the entrance door to that house ten. So it's clearly uh, some type of, of important object that, that had been placed there for uh, perhaps protection or some type of, of uh, ritual, uh, you know, ritual purpose. Uh, so if, if we're finding that in, in a single house, uh, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, additional excavations of, of dino houses uh, is not going to you know, provide at least some basis to try to address the kind of question that you, you've just posed. But, um, you know, it's, it's metaphysics right now <laughs> in terms of <laughs> trying to guess uh, exactly uh, what is going on. Yeah, uh, I understand. Uh, Robin, what do you think about Sevilla La Nueva? I mean, uh, I know in Deegan's work, there's a lot of recovery of crucifixes and, and other, and, and, and I mean, you talked about the church. What, what, what about the dynamics of, of belief at, at a site like that? Well, we haven't found, at least uh, Charles Cotter didn't find any religious artifacts in the material that he found. And I certainly haven't found any, but I should note that there were two smaller churches made out of wood that burned down, um, sort of thatch and wood that we know that burned down before they started the Stone Abbey, which was um, the money for which was given um, uh, by uh, a very influential bishop and writer, uh, uh, s certainly. Um, but the uh, and certainly the arrival of the Catholic Church uh, it was a huge statement to put such a large abbey in a what should have been a, a, a sort of a backwater place had it not been for the patron who supplied the money. And certainly the money was matched uh, uh, by the, uh, the king himself, the king and the queen sent an equal amount of money and we have their royal portraits carved in stone, although they weren't finished. You, we've got these two heads with sort of crowns. We have bits and pieces of the Spanish coat of arms uh, as well in that sculpture um, stuff. But it, um, the Spanish archaeologists under the direction of William Lopez worked at the site for two years. Uh, their boxes are at the National Trust, but we don't know which one of the units corresponds to which number, and that's 400 units across the property that oh we don't goodness. know belong, uh, which belongs to the Abbey and which came from the field down below. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so we have, you know, when I was excavating, I was excavating areas that had sort of been previously excavated, and I found stuff in the bulks that hadn't, that the Spanish hadn't excavated, because I got rid of the bolts, just followed the foundation lines so I could find what the whole foundation looked like. But very little material culture left there except for some uh, of the building materials. So whether there were graves underneath the central floor that Lopez found, um, we're not sure. There were some uh, 20th century graves at the back of the church, uh, which had certainly Lopez had found and the Catholic congregation had reburied those closer to the current church. Um, we found one grave from probably what Dave the 19th century just off to the side by the nails, you know, sort of a, you know, sort of mid 19th century by the nails that we had. So um, nothing that was there and sadly very little in the way of religious artifacts across the site. Okay. It's interesting you mentioned that, that we don't have a report, whether it's in Spanish or in English, about uh, that, that large, the largest, sounds, the largest excavation at Sevilla La Nueva in the 80s by, by, by Lopez. Is there any documentation or reports on that? No, and I even went to Spain and met with them. And Yikes. I basically got the impression that hell might freeze over before I got it. So uh, one of his grad students said he would give some stuff to me if I paid him to, uh, to go find it. Um, but I haven't sort of gone, you know, sort of pursued that. Uh, I just re-excavated the material. And, and Dave, uh, there was one small report given on Myema 
just sort of saying, you know, been there, found things, and that was, and and that is about it. There was no reports filed with the National Trust, with the Jamaican National Trust, on, okay. on, on that. One of the things. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. One of the things that the Spanish didn't do at Maima is they didn't backfill, which, as it turned out, was probably very good for us because <laughs> we found it easily enough. <laughs> exactly where they had excavated. Um, so that was uh, that was uh, I guess a plus. I I just want to say um, well, people are still online that uh, we've written a couple of reports uh, that are available. Um, that I'm quite happy if anybody wants to email me, I can send them, uh, you know, sort of a low resolution copy by email um, of the reports and, and on my email, uh, as well as uh, we just finished one up on the Spanish butchery. Uh, so those are available if anybody would like to have a copy. And my email address is just simply Burley, B U R L E Y, as my name, at SFU, Simon Fraser University, so at sfu.ca. So if anybody would, would like to have those, um, certainly get in touch. Thank you for that offer, Dave. And, and, and for folks in the audience, you can obviously, if you didn't note that, you can follow up with archaeologyjamaica at gmail.com or our website, and we, will, we are here, here to assist you uh, in your, in your uh, what, uh, adventures through Jamaican archaeology. We have had a couple questions uh, and this gets us to the topic of your relationship with Jamaica National Heritage Trust. What will be done with the research and the artifacts found? As uh, I don't want to provide the answer, I would have thought that your your relationship required that artifacts are either left at the current uh, Seville Museum on site there or deposited along with the Jamaica National Heritage Trust headquarters in Kingston. But uh, that would just be my assumption there. Um, all of the reports, and Dave and I did write annual reports uh, when we were there, uh, are with the National Trust. I believe for the most part, we also supply the University of West Indies with them. Um, the theses that have been written are either in line um, through the SFU archaeology department. Uh, my one in the Cotter collection is online through Texas A&M through the nautical archaeology department. Um, I'm just finishing off a report on the um, the Abbey right now, and Dave and I are collaborating on sort of a wrap-up book of um, for the Spanish site um, that we were thinking of certainly going online with that too, so it would be more widely available. All right, all, and so... And certainly well, all the artifacts are, uh, for the most part, we have brought sample artifacts, some the faunal material, came back uh, to be identified by the students here and to do some DNA studies on them. And uh, we've got a little bit of pottery up here, but all of the, uh, the carving, of course, you're not gonna transport rocks mm -hmm. of that, that size up here. Everything is either at, uh, is, is at Seville. The Cotter Collection, uh, some of it is at the National Trust, but most of it is also at the museum in Seville. So folks, uh, this is the, the, the what the, the standard in research, you, you, you come, you report, you leave the, the, the materials, unless it's for advanced testing with, with the governing bodies on the island. So thank you for, for uh, uh, addressing that. We've all, I did not expect us to go all the way up to one o'clock and, and thank you for your patience. We have uh, uh, first a question from Ryan Cousins. Has there been any studies on trade routes and trading among the Jamaican Taino population? Uh, perhaps Ivor, uh, uh, if you're following that question, it's pretty, it's pretty big, it's open-ended, but uh, obviously the, the question of trade and interaction is definitely significant. And you all, I think, already addressed this in talking about how Maima was likely a satelliting community in line with some, some larger ones scattered throughout Jamaica, but also perhaps even aligned across the sea, right, across the Caribbean. The sea was not a was not a wall like our like President Trump wants to build. It, it was a highway. People were using it in order to connect dots, right? So, Ivor, what do you think about that question? Yeah, will will we find a uh, green stone that's um, not in yes. you know indigenous to Jamaica, and that uh, certainly would be a trade item? Um, we we're seeing them maybe maybe in trading pottery as well, or people might have been just moving from one province to the other province and taking pot, pots with them. Uh, but 
that might have been another trade item. Um, so yes, trading was taking place. More specifically, well, we have to do some more research. Well, and you're absolutely right, Ivor. And it, these these islands were relied on not only trade but also on in and out migration. And I think more DNA studies, more isotope analysis, uh, uh, will will likely provide us a sense of just because you died in Jamaica does not mean you're necessarily born there, right? Uh, so trade interaction there's migration. This, 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 this. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that there's this um, from the chronicles and. Um, Spanish Chronicles that uh, indicated that Columbus no sooner left one of the islands that he had landed at and um, he overtook a China boat. And in that boat were hawk bells and stuff that he just traded with that island. So these guys were not wasting any time trading across the islands. So clearly that's what they did. So we can say, yes, trading took place, but let's get the specifics. Let's get the evidence to see what they were trading, where across which boundaries, island or within the island itself of Jamaica, where were they trading? Thank yes, you, Ivor. Thank you, thank you again. Look, we've got a couple more questions. I'm gonna try my best to combine ones that are a bit sim similar. People are very interested in, in the location of the materials and if there are inventories for these collections. I doubt, Robin and Dave, you can speak to uh, what, what the Spanish team in the 1980s, what their standard of, of uh, uh, curation, collection management were, were, but what about, how did you organize and, and uh, uh, submit your collections and reports? Well, certainly uh, the Spanish did uh, excavate everything in, mostly in two by two meters. Some are four by four meters in the fields. Um, they did take copious notes. I went in there. They used to cover e everything up. Uh, uh, they didn't leave copies of any of their notes or maps. Um, so they're in Spain. In Jamaica? Oh, my no. goodness. Okay. Uh, all the copies of Dave's and my notes, there's uh, photocopies of all of our notes uh, there with the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, uh, everything was numbered and they were given copies of those those inventories that went with them as well as copies of our maps. Uh, so, you know, if you want to know what unit I excavated, you'd know where to find that particular one um, that that's there. So there's, there's inventories of ours. Uh, certainly Cotter actually made maps and uh, left his, not an inventory, but I inventoried all of his collection and numbered it all, and that's also at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust. Thank you, Robin. Dave? The Maima, um, there are a few bits and pieces that uh, we brought back, uh, the historic artifacts, but those will be going back to uh, the trust shortly. Um, the, almost all of the uh, Maima ceramics um, are, are based, we left at the, uh, at the park, so they're being stored uh, at the you know, Seville Heritage Park uh, now. We have uh, full catalogs of uh, these materials. The, everything was excavated stratigraphically uh, in uh, one by one meter excavation units contiguously. So we tried to expose the occupation floor and then and then do that contiguously. So it's it's fairly uh, standard uh, approach with. Uh, small, you know, with trowels and, and uh, small hand tools. So, uh, and anything that uh, we could, we, we were able to map. So we have, uh, you know, I, if you look at the butchery site, it's all cobbles. It's two cobble terraces. And we map every one of those cobbles and every brick on top of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God bless you guys. I'm telling you, this is. I mean, if you look at my map of that, of that sculpture's workshop, it's all that. <laughs> yeah. Look, and that's the level of detail and precision that that we need here, especially for you know some of the complicated questions and issues that we're seeing. Uh, we've got a good question from Robert Hook, uh, Dave. I think, and and Ivor perhaps best able to address this. What percentage of Maima has been excavated? And has anyone reached any conclusions about the morphology of the settlement? Thank you, uh, Bob, for that question. And I just want to follow up Bob's 
question with the observation that large portions of my EMA, I went out there with, with Ivor, it has been informally settled by, by you know, small scale uh, houses and, and farming practices, which obviously shouldn't happen. But if this area was more clearly and systematically continuously excavated and incorporated into the broader Seville Heritage National Park property, I think that would, I mean, I think that would solve some of our issues. But thank you for that question, Bob. And, and, and Dave, what, what do you, and Dave, Ivor, what do you, what do you think about those issues? Uh, I mean, in, in the eastern side, uh, we've probably excavated, I would guess, maybe 1% um, at most uh, of the site. Uh, two houses out of, out of what we could identify as 12 houses. Um, but undoubtedly, with additional, uh, additional work there, um, there's, there's other, going to be other, other uh, houses that, that will show up, other residences. Those things that I identified as platforms uh, are in a plowed, uh, not plowed, but an agricultural field. So that's being farmed uh, continuously. So, um, and they're quite clear on the surface. There's ceramics, there's shellfish, there's uh, limestone gravel, you know, um, and uh, those could certainly, uh, um, you know, use some, some additional work before they become overly uh, destroyed. But, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, Maima needs a lot more work, as do most of the sites on the north shore of, 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 uh, of Jamaica. There's so many sites that uh, could use more work, uh, not the least being the one that, that's probably the most heavily uh, explored, and that's the one that you've been working on in terms of white marl. So, um, but I, we do hope. And, and we've made serious recommendations to the trust as part of the report. So if you get the report, you can, you can read the recommendations. One of the recommendations was that uh, the, the site on the west or on the eastern side uh, of the gully, uh, there's limited, at least there was when we were there, a very limited, a couple of small residences there. Uh, we are hoping that the trust would, in fact, integrate that, make it known that you know, this is not an area for expansion of settlement uh, from the other side of the gully and, uh, you know, sort of put a protective mandate uh, there. And this is particularly important uh, because, of course, uh, the, Seville, the whole Seville area is, is, under, is under a UNESCO, uh, potential UNESCO designation as a world, for the World Heritage List. Um, and, you know, that comes with it as, as a serious uh, requirement for on heritage conservation so yeah well and i mean we got sometimes a problem in jamaica with buffer zones whether it's cockpit country port royal new cruise ship uh pier uh seville but these boundaries are so very very important especially in a place like seville uh, around a, a kilometer away from uh what uh, uh potential sunken columbus caravels so Thank you, uh, Ivor. Anything to add on this question? I, and I will say all I know, there's at least two other comments, questions in the chat. We are already past our one o'clock hour. I wanna give Ivor uh, the opportunity to, to reflect, provide any further reflections on Maima, how much has been excavated, potentially more work throughout the island. Uh, and then I will conclude and uh, I will thank you all for your, for your attendance. Ivor, what do you think? Yes, well, I'd just like to concur with Dave on that. That's a very small percentage of the site has been excavated, and that's between uh, Robin's and Dave's work and uh, Lopez's work. I mean, there's still a lot more that can be done, and a lot more that can be understood about how the Chinas live on that site. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's it. All right, well, thank you, Ivor, and always forward, never backward. That's what we're doing here with Archaeological Society of Jamaica, Jamaican archaeology, period. Thank you all so much, the contributors. A serious thank you for your participation. Uh, thank you all to our, our audience. Please stay tuned to the ASJ, the Archaeological Society of Jamaica. We've got a new website. We're doing social media now after 55 years. We're virtual. Uh, and we also st are, are trying to more regularize 
our, our, our emails and communication with you, but we need your support. So follow up uh, our, our membership list. You can contact us directly at archaeologyjamaica uh, at gmail.com. We're now doing a variety of activities that, again, we need your support. We need, uh, we're, we're, once this COVID uh, scene passes, if it, well, field trips, room rentals for our annual symposium, new websites, outreach activities, a Zoom account, maybe that can accommodate more than 100 people. Uh, so just thank you all. Please follow up, stay in tune with the Archaeological Society of Jamaica, and, and uh, uh, be in contact. Thank you all.